Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial and your co-host for this program. Mm -hmm. Now, thanks for joining us today for this special private screening and discussion with the filmmakers of the documentary, Writing with Fire, which has been shortlisted for an Academy Award. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118 year old nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to the simple discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed here are those of the speakers. Uh, you can find more upcoming programs as well as video and audio of past events at commonwealthclub.org. Now let's sit back and view Writing with Fire. After the film is over, Michelle and I will be back to interview the filmmakers. Let's watch the film. Wow, हमारे प्रदेश में दलित औरतों का पत्रकार के रूप में कोई सोच भी नहीं सकता। 14 साल में हमने इस मानसिकता को काफी हद तक बदला है। क्योंकि मैं उस जगह से हूँ। माजी अमारू है। मेरे लिए तो बहुत ही रिस्की है। इन दमंग लोगों ने क्या किया उसको पत्थर मारकर हत्या कर दी और किसी पर भरोसा नहीं एक लहरिया ही ऐसे न्याय दिला सकती है एक हैरान वाली बात है कि थाने को पता नहीं पुलिस स्टेशन को पता नहीं है कभी 11 बजे कभी 12 बजे कोई टाइमिंग है नहीं है इस जगह पे मैं हूं उस जगह पे अगर आप होते तो क्या करते पहले अपना काम बाद में देखो मुझे तो नहीं लगता है संगे शक्ति का योग है संगठन है संगठन में शक्ति हो जो आपके साथ संगठन है वो देश के भविष्य में किस तरह भागी रहेगी हर कोई को जानना चाहिए कि हाँ हम पत्रकार थे एक महिला पत्रकार और किस तरह की पत्रकार काम ने किए मेरा दिल हौसला देता है मेरे लिए <laughs> Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao. She's the producer and host of the Michelle Miao show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Hello again Michelle. Thank you John and thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed the film as much as we did. What a what a powerful impactful film. So we're excited to introduce to you our speakers today, the filmmakers of Writing with Fire, Rintu Thomas and Shushmit Ghosh. Shushmit, Rintu, thank you so much for this film and thanks for joining us all the way from India. Thank our you absolute pleasure. Um, good evening. Almost, we're, we're on to the next day now almost, but um, thank you for having us, Michelle and John. Very much looking forward to this. Yeah. Well, let's jump right into our conversation. Let's start with you know, the the uh, the decision to make this documentary and to focus on um, the women journalists of Kabar Leria. And I, I would imagine that, you know, you are experiencing the same experiences as they are. They're doing reporting, but you're you know following them. You're getting you know, similar footage, maybe even facing the same um, kind of attitudes or dangers even, right? So Rinti, would you like to begin for us? 
Sure. Um, you know, Sushmit and I have been working as independent filmmakers in India for over a decade now, and our focus has largely been short nonfiction. And a lot of our protagonists have been women. So that's a very natural draw. The way women look at the, their realities, find solutions um, in a language of hope and resilience, we get really drawn to uh, uh, such protagonists. And uh, so it, the the initial draw to the to the premise of the story was very natural um and uh, but this was for the first time that we were working with women who were media makers um and speaking in our own language of shots and scenes and um uh, uh storyboards so it so i think it was a very very um different dynamic where we could have a lot more informed conversations with, with the women about access, about consent, about what our lens is going to be, because that is one of the first questions that they asked um, after they met us. Why do you want to make a story on us? Um, and they had the experience of short films being made on them, but not a feature length. So they, there were many... Uh, I think evolved conversations and uh, we were able to share our work with them. Um, and also when we started filming with them, there was this meta narrative playing out in front of our eyes, us filming them, them filming their subjects. And uh, I think we went with a genuine sense of curiosity and patience to just stay with them uh, until we got access into first their professional worlds, then their personal worlds. And then I think our relationship was enveloped with this um, beautiful thing called trust. And from there evolved friendship. So it's been a very uh, beautiful layered journey with each one of them and, and Cavaleria as a group. It was interesting watching this. And I really thought this right from the beginning of, these these women because you're you're talking you're interviewing them and they're talking about their decisions to become involved and in, in, as journalists including not just the some of the opposition they face outside their family but within their their very families and such and I'm watching this and I'm thinking this not only of course is 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 giving them what it, they're not only doing their their work is not only doing good and having an effect on the community around them but it does seem to be personally giving them some power. And, and, you know, they're the ones who are standing there talking to these party members, these police officers and asking them questions and they're asking great questions. Um, talk a bit about maybe if you would, they're, they're coming to, to understand their, their expressions of power and, and, and uh, uh, how they use it and how it's changed them. If that's not too incredibly broad of a question. No, I mean, uh... The, the thing is that, you know, people have not seen Dalit women necessarily in positions of power. And I think that they are reframing that power dynamic. And, 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 and the fact that you have Dalit women stepping out of their homes, going into spaces that can be seen as incredibly hostile and sticking a phone camera into the faces of, you know, these patriarchs, so to speak, uh, questioning them about their own authority is something that really stumped people, especially in the early years. So they, they made a shift from print, 14 years of print, to digital in 2016. And I think 2016 was a fascinating year for us as filmmakers to actually watch what was playing out on the ground because as they would enter these police stations or go into these political offices or go into these big administration buildings, asking for transparency, asking for budgetary allocations and talking the language of any mainstream journalist with a certain kind of nuance and sophistication, most men were not used to that. And you see that in these scenes where they're stumped and they don't know how to respond because they have a camera that's recording live. Uh, so you can't run away as well. And I think that that's a power dynamic that the women journalists also caught up to uh, and, and, and used quite gracefully in their work. But I also feel just to pull back, um, I think they have inverted, you know, the social power structures, so to speak, by, by doing what they're doing. And they've done it like for the longest time. We have not seen uh, Dalit women represented as, as 
bodies that can manifest and be infused with a certain kind of you know uh, systemic change or create systemic change and and uh, and 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 the team at cover lehria has has since their founding in 2002 been doing exactly that the fundamental shift came with digital where they were able to really amplify their stories and their work and i think that had that decision to shift to digital had a profound effect on not only the work that they were doing but how their work was received and seen because now millions of people are consuming the news that they are putting out and they are really reframing the narrative because it's a question of you know the diversif- diversification of the newsroom it's not middle aged upper caste traditional men who are defining what indian news is going to be but it's essentially these women who have lived in these media dark spaces who are redesigning the narrative and they've literally pulled a chair to the table and said this is what our news is going to be like look like and feel like and that's what they've been doing to great success and i think that essentially is is the anchor for their bar you mentioned 2016 shishmit where now in 2022 and it's an interesting conversation around social media access to smartphones and um just how that all has affected political elections around the world I'm curious to hear you know how people feel how people of the uttar pradesh um area or even northern india feel about uh journalism today um especially the women journalists of kabar leria and uh, if you know yes the continuance of their work but how do they feel about them today any one of you can answer by the way well i think we'll all have different sets of answers when do you want to go for that i think the context is very important here um the region in which they work in um being a journalist has always been the prerogative of dominant caste men um and uh, mainstream newspapers who do employ women journalists have usually been given softer beats uh like fashion or food um and and not what is considered intelligent or hardcore reporting like crime and politics uh, so those beats uh, you women are bis- missing so even when we were filming our journalists and i would be the only women with walls and walls of men which we've tried to capture in the film you see these the, the hordes of men and then uh, a, sh- a very short woman with her phone camera uh, standing witness and and that was very i think that that imagery defines their role um in within the larger indian media landscape um and also the fact that because this this year 2022 is going to be their 20th year and that shift that happened in 2016 feels in retrospect as a historic one uh because it was primarily uh taken to expand their reach and expand the demographic of the audience of the viewership uh, uh of their uh newspaper so because lit- there are barriers to literacy their newspaper was consumed mostly by men and now with very high penetration of cell phones and internet within even the most rural pockets of india everybody has a phone and women are consuming um this content uh, and and engaging with it and not only is khabaleria giving a feminist um lens to the whole idea of news making but also creating content which is completely missing for rural women um uh, you know in conversations around menstruation about premarital sex and relationships these these are taboo subjects and they're visibilizing them in a language that it can be uh, understood by everybody and i think that's a huge shift when that is how you change culture when you normalize what is considered taboo so while the media landscape in india as is in the rest of the world highly aggressive and competitive and male led this particular voice has been growing uh, consistently and in that way they're not a flash in the pan experiment they have their roots deep and that's where the trust uh, in in the communities that they work and there's a lot of uh, trust um and and that's how they are growing so i think social media really is like the fire 
uh, that the film's title alludes to. You can really cook your food and it can guide, uh, you know, warm uh, home or burn uh, things to dust. And, and that really is how I see it. It's interesting to talk about social media. Uh, Michelle and I inter interviewed uh, Maria Ressa from the Philippines uh, a year or so ago. And she's really been talking out about the role of social media as kind of interference in and, and, and manipulation of news and, and people's kind of views of, of what's going on. Um, for, for these women to have made that leap from print to digital, and to be succeeding. I mean, there are major newspapers in the United States that have totally fumbled social, mm -hmm. social media and, and digital. They just don't know how to do that. They're not set up structurally. They don't understand their audiences. They set it up as a separate division that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, for most of them, it seems to have really been a failure. Um, how do they make their decisions on what to do, how to evolve, uh, what, where to, invest their time and their, their people so that they've, because they've clearly been making some really good choices and successfully. I'll, I'll, maybe like an anecdote would be a good one to start this off with. So this is a scene that didn't make it to the final cut of the film. And this is this, about 28 of them. You know, this is a cold winter morning. And so there was some patch of sunshine on the roof and they all went and huddled together. And they have these monthly meetings where they decide allocations for the next 30 days, who's going to do what, what are the beats, what are the stories we're going to cover, who's doing the bigger pieces, who's doing the report, uh, repeat coverage. And in this one conversation, they started talking about the Me Too movement because that was a big thing. And this was about a couple of years ago. Um, actually, we're in a time warp. This is about four years ago. Yeah, uh, 2020 seems to have just passed. So, um, and, uh, and, and we were pleasantly taken aback because they were looking at news that was coming out from, say, the mainstream press on social media. And then they retranslated that as, okay, how about the women in our villages? Because we know of so many stories within our communities, within our spaces, and these women will never come out. So how can we find ways to actually amplify those important narratives without, and again, themes of consent, themes of who's telling whose stories and how are we representing them, themes of safety protocols. And so Shamkali, who is this cub reporter you see in the film, who's always sort of like, you know, um, taking missteps as far as technology is concerned, asks, oh, you know, I know of this uh, woman who talked about this one particular instance but that happened many years ago. And But does that fit into our story around Me Too? And the rest of the team was like, yeah, that does. Because, and and, and the nuance with which they, they actually designed the entire Me Too campaign that they did for a month uh, was exceptional. And I think they're always clued into these larger global conversations that are taking place and smartly finding ways to... Um, um, redefine them and re-illustrate them from their perspective. So what does Me Too mean for uh, a rural uh, woman who maybe does not have access to that conversation, but has an important story to share? You know, so, so that's how they've been able to find ways and pathways into this social media landscape. And also, I think the other thing that's also helped them is that India is not yet a saturated market. We're one of the largest markets for mobile phones. Um, and internet penetration is, is deep, but there's still a long way to go. And I think that that growing number uh, of people translates to a potential growing number of viewers for their news channels. And that's something that they were hedging their bets on way back in 2016 when they were making this decision. Because the paper used to run about 5,000 physical prints every, every two weeks. And so they calculated that their readership was uh, roughly 15,000 people uh, and primarily men, because in these parts of um, the country, essentially men would complete their schooling uh, and not women. Uh, so, so they realized that they would be able to expand their demographic as well. And that's exactly what happened when they monitor uh, the data from Facebook and YouTube they are seeing more women across a broad spectrum of ages who are watching the news. 
So they've been able to smartly use the tools that have been deployed by these big uh, data giants, much to their own use, and been able to sort of deliberate on how to create the news and how to effectively sort of reach uh, the viewer that they are intending to reach and more. Rinti, you mentioned trust earlier, and as a viewer, you could really um, feel that trust, you know, the trust between the journalists and their subjects, the trust between your own cameras and the journalists and the folks that you're capturing. And so I feel like, you know, all of that um, is felt through even the, the witnessing of the power shift that is happening throughout the entire film. What can you say about, you know, how this power shift could really affect issues like gender-based violence um, and, and other future issues and this, you know, the sustainability of, or of how women journalists will change news and news consumption as you both have been talking about. I think we saw the different manifestations of power um, all playing out in front of our cameras. Uh, there is a kind of power that can be very autocratic and um, all consuming and um, uh, gets its uh, uh, firepower from keeping people divided and, 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 and you know, othering. Uh, people. And there is another kind of power which is all-encompassing um, uh, and, and believes that uh, social change is possible um, and can be led from the front. And, and it does not, I'd say there are many, many obstacles, but there is a way to create an alternative structure. And I think what we were witnessing was the clash of these two powers, but not in an aggressive way. Um, I think one of the biggest lessons I learned uh, staying with the women is to ask the right questions. And uh, a lot of us forget that um, because it is not an, an interview is not an interrogation. It is a conversation with someone whose politics, whose worldview you don't agree with, but you go in with a genuine uh, desire to um, know the mind of that person and maintain that relationship. So, uh, there are many, many, many manifestations of power, power inside uh, a family. When a woman has access to education, um, she's financially more secure and therefore has more decision-making power within her home. Um, and, you know, so those, those kind of metrics were constantly shifting and it was a delight to watch, especially with someone like Sunita, who really gets it and, and can portray it in many um, interesting ways. Uh, she insists on um, hanging out with her male colleagues and has a very comfortable relationship with them because she knows that peer to peer respect is, is very important for her because it gives her access into uh, press briefings, et cetera, which otherwise she might not. So you see them consistently negotiating um, uh, and navigating consistently. And I think that is that is how things change, right? We are all invested in this idea of things need to change. I want to fight injustice, but how? Uh, and I think that is what this, this film kind of spotlights on. These women can give a masterclass on just the act of showing up every day, even if it means you're going to hit um, dead ends, you're going to be mansplained, uh, you're going to be <laughs> minimized, but you're going to show up anyway, because if you don't, then who else will? And there is a very crazy, inexplicable, in through words, power there, which is very, very attractive. I think just to like add to that, something that we observed and then re-looked at was our own understanding of what this word power and powerful means because in itself if you think about it we instinctively we, we feel power needs to feel and be of a certain kind and you have a certain kind of imagery when you think of the word powerful and and in a sense it's kind of gender skewed it's typically men or your notions of power are built around something that's very visual visceral dynamic and i think what we saw was here is a manifestation of power that is graceful, compassionate, and wise. 
And that's also power. And I think that's something that we wanted to sort of underscore through the narrative of the film, that these women here are not carrying swords. These women here are not on the streets rioting, but they are actually rewriting um, essentially what the meaning of power is through the work that they do, not only outside, but also within their homes, where now Mira's daughters have a shot at actually completing their school, going to university, getting jobs, and getting married to the men of their choice. And I think that's a massive redefinition and a shift that's taking place because of the work that the journalists at Kabul Lehri are doing, to be able to see our mothers, our daughters, our sisters, you know, do what they do and, 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 and essentially sort of redefine for us possibilities of what women can be uh, is so, so important. And I think that's what we ended up seeing the, the, the four or five years that we spent with them on the ground. And it was, it was really, I mean, as Rintu said, a masterclass in being able to negotiate through these spaces that uh, very gently, but, but also quite firmly. Uh, this film has won awards and it is shortlisted uh, for the Academy Awards. Um, talk a bit about what this means to be in that group. Uh, I mean, you're independent filmmakers. You're, you're, you're not, there's not a billion dollar company producing this film. What, what was it like and, and wh where is this developing for you? The film premiered at Sundance um, mm -hmm. earlier in 2021, where it picked up two awards. And so for, for us, because we had directed, produced, edited, and social media also shot the film, I did the on-location sound recording. So for us, it felt like our job is done. You know, you now just push the film out there and, and distribution or whoever else is an expert in this will take it forward. And that was the biggest, you know, misinformation that we had because it was... It's been a tedious, um, exciting, but very, very, you know, we, we've had to be in the trenches with, with an entirely virtual year, putting the film out there, building an audience. And it's been super heartening to see everywhere it's been. It's been to 100 plus festivals. People write, uh, tag the, uh, you know, the social media handles of the film or tag Kabaleria and say, we love the film. And a lot of times the word, a word that people use a lot is I'm inspired. Um, uh, and, and that is very powerful. And that's when we realized that the film has a lot of love. And, and so towards the end of the year, when the whole, uh, you know, campaigning was picking up, we just uh, fueled the visibility of the film on on the basis of that kind of love for the film within the dog branch because we genuinely didn't have the marketing dollars um, to to blast the film out there. It's really been grassroots people to people um, sharing of the film. So when we were on the shortlist and and when people said that this is the first Indian film by um, an Indian uh, crew to be fully produced by an Indian crew to be on the uh, shortlist. It was just like, wow. Uh, and, and we all, uh, you know, we got the news at, at midnight our time in India and we woke up Meera um, and, and gave her the news and there was this collective joy and, and, you know, and they said that we're in the business of making history. So it just feels like uh, this is an extension of that. And every time the film, I think, has a milestone, it puts a larger spotlight on the work of Kabbaleria. And that is super important. Um, you know, it's deeply connected to the journey of the film. So um, just, just a very exciting time for all of us. I think, I think it's also, just to add to that, exciting because it's opening up these newer conversations around how far can a truly independent film go? Uh, because the assumption that's built into it is you need big bucks and streamer dollars to be able to do this. Um, and a lot of times, you know, systems are not designed around merit, but what you have in terms of resources. Uh, and I think that, you know, this has opened up conversations for more independent filmmakers to actually reimagine um, what, what the future pathways for their films could look like. Because if a film from the global south with no connections to systems and industry over here could actually 
set these milestones. And I mean, I think the first doc film that actually also got a PGA nomination and an IDA nomination for Best Feature. I mean, it's it's been super critical, but it's also led to more conversations opening up about, oh, guys, how did you do this? Oh, if you could do this, then possibly I could also follow the same route. And also within sort of like the industry in the US, this conversation about what truly is an independent film? What does that really mean? mean? And what is the process of making of the making of a film? Because that's equally important as the product itself. And I think I think that's been something that's been really good to see. That apart from actually making the shortlist, writing with fire actually started generating these conversations, which have always existed, but it's always also stoking those fires and and leading it. Uh, you know, the conversations, keeping them alive because it's about opening more doorways for future filmmakers from parts of the world where they do not have the resources to do this, but it is possible to do it. So, yeah. I want to thank you so much for writing with fire and we're so excited for you. The world should see writing with fire. And um, so our last question for you, because I know that we've crossed over to the next day now it's, it's <laughs> a little over midnight there in India as we want to let you go um, is yeah. What's next. I mean, you know, when can people in the United States um, see it or w- what are the plans for writing with fire for the global audience? We're coming on um, independent lens in March. So it's, that's when uh, public television brings the film to audiences in the U.S. We have a, um, a lot more uh, uh, television premieres across the world. So uh, we hope that more and more Larger groups of audience and different demographics are able to watch it. The film's website is constantly updated with the festivals that continue to program it. So, you know, it will be here, there, everywhere. Just seek it out. Um, and we that's really the dream that like everybody and their family watch the film. Well, everyone, go see it however you can. Look it up, Writing with Fire. Thank you, Rintu Thomas and Shushmit Ghosh. Thank you for being a part of our program today and for giving us the opportunity to screen Writing with Fire. Back to you, John. John, Michelle, thank you so much. What a lovely chat. Thanks again to our special guests on the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. And last but not least, thanks to all of you for watching and listening online. You can find more programs at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. Stay safe, have a good week, and good night to you in India.